So now that the door is closed, you're... <laughs> you can't escape, you can start. Um, so last time, here's what we had done. We had realized that X embeds through that map eta into something that can be either the set of points of the open set lattice of X, or uh, in an alternate form, the subrefication of X. <coughs> And uh, so typically that mapped every point x here to, well, in that space, which is a space of irreducible closed sets, uh, an irreducible closed set, let me remind you, that's a closed set C such that if C is included in the union of two closed sets, so first C is not empty, and if C is included in C1 union C2 where C1 and C2 are closed, then C is included in C1 or C is included in C2. That is irreducible. And so S of X was a set of irreducible closed sets equipped with a topology uh, whose open sets were called diamond U and defined as, so that should be a set of irreducible closed sets, so it's a set of irreducible closed sets C, and this is defined as a set of C's that intersect U, and that is a topology. If you look at it here, that gives you something else that gives you uh, completely prime filters and so on. So that map eta maps every point x to an element of that, which was the completely prime filter of, a completely of open neighborhoods of x. And if you look at the equivalent thing here, that gave you the downward closure of x, which is closed and irreducible. So that's the quick summary of what we had done last time. <coughs> Um, but not a complete one, because what we had shown was that S of X is sober, which is an apt name considering that it's, uh, S of X is called a sobrification. It's meant to make things sober. So S of X is sober, and sober is defined by um, it's a space. So a space Y is sober. If and only if, uh, there are two equivalent definitions. I'm currently wondering which one I'm going to take. So if it is T0, that is the specialization quasi-ordering is an ordering. And the uh, irreducible closed sets are exactly the sets of the form down arrow X. Okay, there's no other one. This is um, abbreviated. Okay. So as you can see, um, well, so we had shown that S of X is sober. Now, let me remind you what the, we started with as a problem. The problem we started with was, in which case do we retrieve X? or at least a homeomorphic copy, homeomorphic meaning isomorphic in the realm of topological spaces, uh, by this construction where we take the open set lattice and then we try to reconstruct space from it. And I'm claiming that the idea is, when is that an isomorphism? Okay, now look. Imagine eta Imagine eta is an isomorphism. Then in particular, it's bijective, right? Um, this is not quite what I wanted to say. <laughs> but at least, um, if eta is an isomorphism, sobriety is a property that is preserved under isomorphisms. 
Okay, so if that works, then x must be sober. So if you take a non-sober space, you will not manage to do that. Here's an example of a non-sober space. In fact, it's an example we have already seen. You take 0 below 1, below 2, so that is an ordering, below 3, and so on. So the set of natural numbers ordered with the usual ordering. And so, and we take the Alexandros topology of that. That is the open sets are exactly the upwards closed subsets, so the empty set, and uh, the upward closure of every point. So it, this is an open set, this is an open set, this is an open set, this is an open set. And we had seen that if we did that construction, sorry, O then PT, what you, what you obtained was a space which was essentially the same one plus a new element omega. Mm -hmm. And that new space with the added element is S of X. It's PT O of X, it's S of X. And eta maps 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 2 to 2. Ah, damn, omega is not reached. Mm -hmm. So eta in that case is not bijective. So that space can't be sober. Is that true? Uh, no, not it, it is true, but I haven't justified that yet. So what I claim is that eta is an isomorphism if and only if eta is bijective, if and only if x is sober. So in particular, what I was trying to do here was to justify that the black space, so without the omega, is not sober because eta is not a bijection in that case. But we can check that uh, directly, if you wish. So how do, you, do we prove that it is not sober? Well, you have to find a closed set uh, that is irreducible, but which is not the downward closure of one point. Hint. Take the downward closure of that point, which doesn't exist. It's not in the black space. Okay. Mm -hmm. So take the whole space, the whole black space. That is closed because it's a complement of an open set, the empty set. Is it irreducible? Well, irreducible means if the set of natural numbers is included in the union of two closed sets, then it should be included in one of them. Okay, so... Okay, but what are the closed sets in the Alexandrov topology? These are the downwards closed sets. Among these, you have two kinds. <coughs> the ones that are bounded from above, that is, the downward closure of one, or the downward closure of two, and so on. And the ones that are not bounded, they contain arbitrarily large elements, but they are downwards closed, so they contain everything below. There's only one, it's n. So if that is included in a union C1, union C2, that union is not bounded. So one of them is not bounded. Okay. Imagine it's C1. If C1 is not bounded, then C1 is n. So C1 contains the whole of n. And if it's not C1, it's C2, okay, by symmetry. So the whole black space is irreducible closed. But in the black space that is without the right element omega, it is not the downward closure of one point. So the black space is not sober. Okay? Um, so I would like to show that the fact that eta is an isomorphism, the fact that eta is bijective, and the fact that x is sober are all equivalent. So this is obvious, okay? Isomorphism implies bijective. Uh, next, what does sober mean? It is T0 and the irreducible closed sets are exactly those of the form down arrow x. So if it is the case, if you take an irreducible closed set, it can be written down arrow x. Imagine it can be written down arrow y as well. Then x is below y, y is below x. So if the space is T0, x equals y. So under T0 and S, that actually means that every irreducible closed set can be written in a unique way as down arrow x. 
And that just means that every element of that, which are the irreducible closed sets, are exactly the eta of a unique element here, meaning that eta is bijective. So these two things are equivalent. Next, how do you prove that um, if eta is bijective, then it's an isomorphism? Okay, so remember, an isomorphism is a bijection which is continuous and whose inverse is continuous. You have to check that. But the inverse, so assuming eta is bijective, so you have an inverse which maps every irreducible closed set which must be of that form for unique x to x. I could call that map eta minus 1, but I would like to take the minus 1 of the, uh, some open sets here. Okay, so if you look at this map and you take the minus 1 of an open set in big X, then what you get is a set of irreducible closed sets, C, of the form down narrow X, such that X is in U. Okay. If C is of that form and X is in U, then certainly C intersects U at X. If C intersects U, C is closed. In fact, it's a downward closure of one point, X. And if C intersects U, let's say at some point here, well, U is upwards closed. So any point higher than a point in U, such as this one, hmm, is in U. So that condition is actually equivalent to C meets U. So that set is exactly diamond U. So the inverse map is also continuous. So we have solved our, our, our initial question. What are the, well, in a certain sense, okay? You might imagine that there would be stranger ways of reconstructing a space from its lattice of open sets. But that is the canonical way. And if I transform the initial question into, uh, given that there's a canonical way uh, to try to, uh, to retrieve the original space from its lattice of open sets, does it work? When does it work? Well, it works exactly when the space is sober. There are two things I would like to do. One is tell you we have an example of a non-sober space here, but what kinds of spaces are sober? There are important uh, classes of spaces which are automatically sober. Um, that is interesting to know. I'm not sure it's very exciting, but I will do it nonetheless. Another thing that I would try to do is to explain that there is an adjunction behind that. So I would like to actually explain adjunctions. So let me start with the first part, and I hope that I will have time to do part of the second part as to, uh, today. Um, so, classes of sober spaces, well, if X, take any topological space, if X is Hausdorff, okay, Hausdorff, sometimes called T2, in French, séparé. Um, yeah, separate means separated, um, but there are many separation properties, except the only one that deserves the word separate in French is the Hausdorff property. So the Hausdorff property, so what I mean, I'll explain Hausdorff later, but I claim that every Hausdorff space is sober. A Hausdorff space is essentially the only spaces that actual topologists ever study. So the ambient space is Hausdorff. Well, assuming it's not the physical space, you know, with uh, particles and all sorts of discrete things, okay, just the real space done with real numbers. And um, that is a Hausdorff space. Um, in fact, there are a few exceptions in mathematics of spaces that are not Hausdorff. 
but typically in algebraic geometry they have these uh, sp spectra of rings with the Zariski topology and essentially every person who is not in algebraic geometry thinks oh yeah they are calling that topology but that's not real topology you know it's not even Hasdorff and uh, of course computer scientists do I mean uh, people who do semantics and with DCPOs and so on um, use spaces that are never Hausdorff, really never. So what is Hausdorff? Well, Hausdorff means, in pictures, that if you take any two distinct points, you can find an open set around the first one, an open set around the second one, such that these two open set sets are disjoint. Um, so why is X sober in that case? Well, I have not done the exercise for a long time, uh, so I hope I will not fail that uh, simple exam. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me remind you that this condition, this definition of a reducibility can also be stated in terms of open sets by saying that if C intersects an open set, u1 and c intersects an open set u2 then it must also intersect the intersection in, of course in general it doesn't work and uh, this is a typical mistake that you see people do uh, when they're young but uh, for an irreducible closed set that works so i want to show that if you have an irreducible closed set in a house of space then it must be double closure of one point first parenthesis I said there are many separation properties, and you see this one is called T2, so there's at least another one. In fact, there's at least two others, because we already know T0. So T0 means if you take two distinct points, there's one open set that contains one point but not the other, and you don't have any control as to which point it is. Then there's T1, and I also said that T0 was a very easy property that meant that the specialization quasi-ordering was an ordering, that is, it is anti-symmetric. Then you have another property, T2, which I said here. Uh, T1 is also a property that you see in mathematics. T1 means if you take two distinct points, then there's one open set containing one point but not the other, and also an open set that contains the other one, but not the first one. But you can't require them to be disjoint. So it may be that you have two distinct points, and you can find an open set of that form, which contains this one, but not this one. And you can find an open set of that form, which contains this one, but not this one. But there all will always be an intersection that, uh, that happens. Oh, by the way, uh, if you want to know of a... So, every person in every domain has his, his own bag of tricks. And uh, in topology, we have a bag of counterexamples. And um, I, I don't uh, remember whether I have um, given that as a counterexample already. But imagine the set of natural numbers with a very strange topology that very strange topology is called the cofinite topology. The cofinite topology says, parenthesis inside the parenthesis, <laughs> instead of defining the open sets, you can define the closed sets. Once you know what they are, you know what the opens are. And to guarantee that this will give you topology, you only need to uh, to, to, to make sure that the dual properties of a topology hold. That is, that the spaces, the sets that you uh, define as closed should be closed under arbitrary intersections and finite union. So let me decide that the closed sets are the finite subsets. This doesn't quite work because among the arbitrary intersections, you have the empty intersection, that is a whole space which is not finite. But that is the only exception. 
the cofinite topology has as closed sets exactly the finite subsets plus the whole space itself. And the complements, the complements give you open sets. And what you get as complements are the cofinite sets, that is the sets whose complement is finite, plus the empty set. That cofinite topology uh, is T1. It's T1 because around any point, if you want to separate two points, okay, two natural numbers, you have to find a cofinite set that contains one but not the other. So typically, if you want to separate 0 from 10, you take the open set, which is the complement of 10. It contains 0, but not the other one. And you take the complement of 0, it contains 10, but not the other one. But these two sets meet. In fact, uh, last time we had talked, uh, thanks to Valentin, of hyper-connected spaces. So spaces in which every uh, two non-empty open sets always intersect. That is the case here. The only non-empty open sets are the sets whose complements are finite. So these are cofinite. Uh, these are sets which cover the whole n of n, except for finitely many points. If you take the intersection, of course, you can still get a set which covers the whole of n except for finitely many points. So in particular, it's definitely not T2. So T1, by the way, an equivalent property is that the specialization quasi-ordering is just equality. I'll let you check that. So in particular, if equality is anti-symmetric, so every T1 space is T0. So T0 is a weaker property than T1. In a T2 space, specialization, <laughs> specialization ordering is equality always. So what I mean is that every T2 space is T1. And the reason is, well, um, imagine that um, x is below y. So what I want to show is that they are actually equal. That means that every open set that contains x contains y. Okay, so imagine they are different. So you can find these two open sets. Here's x, here's y. Every open set containing x must contain y. Oh no, contradiction. So T2 implies T1, T1 implies T0. Be reassured, there's, there are other separation theorems here, uh, properties, oh, sorry. At least there are T3 and T4. I don't think I have ever seen T5. You have? No, I'll, I'll check. <laughs> <laughs> it probably exists, I don't know. But typically what also exists is, pro um, certainly because those people have realized that they had missed some of those properties, so there's a T3 and a half, <laughs> typically. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no T9 3 fourths. <laughs> And, um, and then after that, they have all sorts of uh, fancy properties which don't, are not even called T. For example, I've uh, looked at KT4 and uh, yes. There is 5 and 6. There's 5 and 6, okay. Yeah, 5 is completely normal Hausdorff and 6 is perfectly normal Hausdorff. Okay, <laughs> I see, I see. I never use them. But uh, they're actually useful, but uh, I never use T5 and T6. I, 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 two and a half, you can Close sets. Uh, no, when you can separate closed sets by open sets, that's called a normal space, it's T4. No, uh, but I mean, uh, well, T4 is T2 plus that, actually. The separation um, <coughs> uh, sets, so uh, in the definition of Hausdorff, if you replace open sets by closed sets, ah. you know, to separate, I, I think that's two and a half. Yeah, there's two and a half, if there's three and a half. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure this is two and a half, what you say. Uh, because, well, I, I don't know. I'm not sure either. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so what I want to show is that, in fact, T2 also implies sober. And of course, you know that sober implies T0. Okay. Because I wrote it. Huh? The safest way to ensure something. 
And uh, what I want to say is that T2 implies sober. Okay, let me try to prove it. So, ah, oh, and the parenthesis on these separation properties was to say, I want to show that every reducible closed set is a downward closure of, an, of a point, but the downward closure for a, a specialization ordering, which is equality, okay? So downward closure doesn't do anything. So what I want to actually, in T1 spaces, in particular in T2 spaces, downward closure of points are just the one element point, the one element set. Okay. So the only thing I want to show is that if you take a, an irreducible closed set, it must contain exactly one point. So let C be irreducible closed. Uh, I said somewhere here that an irreducible closed set is non-empty. So there's at least one point. So we have to show that it can't contain a second one. Okay. So imagine that C, so it contains at least one point. Now imagine it contained a second one, a different one. Use the Hausdorff separation property. There's an open set U1 which contains the first one, an open set U2, which contains the second one, and they are disjoint. Oh, but C is irreducible. So we look at that, and we realize that C intersects U1 at X, that C intersects U2 at Y. Um, but since it's irreducible, it should meet the intersection, which is empty. Mm -hmm. Smells bad, right? Mm. So no cannot happen. So C must be of the form just a one element set. So we now know that T2 implies sober. And uh, this is actually why for a long time, and probably still today, uh, many mathematicians said that sobriety was a separation property because it's related to other separation properties. But I claim that it's not at all a separation property. Um, as you've seen in the in example of the natural numbers, to sobrify the space, what we had to do, we had to add a limit point. The best way to think of sobrification is really as adding missing points, so as a completion. Uh, by the way, if you wonder whether there's any relationship between sober and T1, there's absolutely none. <laughs> and we have seen one counterexample. The nice thing is that nice, nicely crafted counterexamples is that you can reuse them for plenty of purposes. And I said that that space is T1. I claim it's not sober. Why is it not sober? Oh, because it contains an irreducible closed set that is not the downward closure of a point. Oh, since the space is T1, that means there's an irreducible closed subset that is not just one point. And that set is just the whole space itself. N itself is closed. And by the remark of Valentin last time, uh, remember I've just said it's hyperconnected. And hyperconnected means irreducible. So that space is irreducible closed. And it's certainly not reduced to one point. And that's the only exception. All the others contain just one point. In fact, if you look at the sobrification of that, sobrification of n with a cofinite topology, well, it's a space which is as follows. You have 0, 1, 2, etc. It's always useful to try to represent the underlying post set with the specialization ordering. All these elements are incomparable. After all, n is t1. And there's a new element which represents the irreducible closed set n itself, which contains all the others. Remember the specialization ordering of s of n or s of x is inclusion. So you have a new one, omega, which represents the whole space n, which is above all the previous elements. And the topology, well, the topology has exactly the same open sets as before. Right? 
at least there are there's a bijection, a lattice isomorphism between O of n <coughs> and O of that. And so before that, we had cofinite open sets, like I'm taking all the points I said finitely many, but now this open set corresponds to that open set in the new space. Okay, so if you open set in N is that, then this is diamond U up to the isomorphism eta. I let you do the exercise. <laughs> 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 and then uh, there was also the uh, empty open set u equals empty and then diamond empty is empty so, so the open sets are the empty set plus the sets that contain omega and all members except finite, uh, for finitely many Okay, so that is the simplification of the space. But since the simplification is not isomorphic to the, spa the original space, the original space is not sober. It's another way to show that n with a cofinite topology is not sober. Well, conversely, if you want to find a sober space which is not T1, well, then you have another account, for example, a very, a very incredibly useful one. You can't imagine. It's called Sherpinsky space. Mm -hmm. Let's be a bit pedantic. <laughs> There's an acute accent on the end. Okay. That means it's not pronounced... Uh, by the way, S-I-E in Polish is not pronounced sie, but sie, sie, Sherpinsky. And that means you don't pronounce pin, but ping. Just mm -hmm. like if it were P-I-N-G. So it's Sherpinsky. Uh, in any case, that. essentially every Polish name ending in, in ski has an acute accent on the end. It's easy. So Sherpinsky space. Well, you've heard about Sherpinsky. Uh, he's invented fractals. Yeah. But this is not a fractal. <laughs> this one is not a fractal. In, in French, we... I mean, it's always uh, attributed to Mandelbrot, no? Yeah. Yes. Oh, but uh, Mandelbrot theorized yeah, the theory of fractals. <laughs> but Sierpinski had already invented spaces like the piano curve. In fact, piano inv invented the first fractal, if you prefer. Okay. <laughs> uh, by the way, um, if you want to find... There's a very interesting paper. I don't know how opinionated it is, but it's certainly very... Uh, very deeply documented, a paper by um, Shimon Donetsky, who despite the Polish name is French. Well, he was probably Polish as well, but uh, uh, he's a professor of mathematics at the University of Bourgogne in Dijon. And uh, Greco, Greco, I don't remember the first name, uh, probably one day. Uh, so they have published a few papers on the legacy of piano, showing that essentially Piano have, has invented plenty of discoveries that don't um, have its, his name on it. So he invented Lebeg measure, <laughs> <laughs> uh, something like 20 years before Lebeg. He invented the Kuratowski point levé uh, the convergence, uh, 50 years before point levé and 80 years before Kuratowski, and so on. And um, so piano didn't just invent piano arithmetic. <laughs> um, so Sherpinsky space. <laughs> sometimes, I, sometimes I, say, I, tell, I tell my students that um, there's a law. You probably know that a law in sociology. You know <laughs> Stigler's law. S T I G L E R. The law says. No, no scientific invention is named after its inventor. Mm -hmm. And Stigler so. presented it at a talk where, as an illustration, he said, in particular, Stigler's law is not due to me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
why am I saying that? Because of piano, of course. <laughs> and sometimes I'm saying to my students that uh, there's another paradox, which is that in the rare cases where a discovery made by you is named after you, it's usually the least complicated one, the most obvious one. <laughs> For example, the, um, there are probably two or three things named after Cantor in mathematics, and the best known one is Cantor's diagonal argument, which of course is clever. Okay? If you haven't seen it before, you'll have trouble inventing it by yourself. But logically, it's rather trivial. It means essentially you can use a variable twice. <laughs> <laughs> Exaggerating slightly. <laughs> but there's worse. As I said last time, Sherpinsky, apparently, I took that from Wikipedia, so I can't tell you of any actual instance. But apparently, Sherpinsky was the author of uh, more than 40 books and 800 scientific papers. <laughs> <laughs> and what people remember from him, apart from the Sherpinsky sponge, is the space with two elements, 0 and 1, with 0 below 1, and the Alexandrov topology of that. Meaning the space whose opens are the, you can list them, the <laughs> empty set, the set that contains just one, the set ca that contains the two elements, but certainly not the set that contains just 0. That's called Sherpinsky space. It's absolutely fundamental. You can't imagine how much. I'll say that later, another day, probably. That space is certainly not T1, okay? The specialization ordering is zero is below than one. But it is sober. In fact, every, po every finite pose set in this Alexandrov topology is sober. Uh, why is it sober? Well, you can check that by enumerating the closed sets, okay? Uh, there are only three closed sets. There's the empty set. Oh, it can't be reducible because the reducible closed sets must be non-empty. And the other ones are just zero or just zero one. But the first one is the downward closure of zero. Second one is the downward closure of one. You don't even have to check which ones are irredu irreducible. They are all irreducible. So this is very trivially sober. sober. Uh, but it's not T1. So these two concepts are completely distinct. So that is one of the us usual examples of a um, uh, well, uh, one of the fundamental classes of spaces that are sober, the Hausdorff spaces. So why why should you actually care about sober spaces? If you're from the mainstream mathematics, you work with Hausdorff Hausdorff spaces anyway. So suddenly you realize that we have done plenty of complicated things to say that it always worked anyway. <laughs> Oh, uh, but then you do computer science. Yes. And then you make all, uh, everything more complicated again. Um, I will probably not prove it because that would need many definitions, uh, many auxiliary definitions, and I will probably explain that another day. But in domain theory, so which is used originally to give semantics to, for uh, programs, you have a notion of a DCPO, a direct complete partial order, which is a post set. So I'm saying that quickly, I don't want to expand on that today. It's a post set in which if you take any directed family, we've seen direct families last time, that directed family goes up in, it's called direct because in a sense it goes into some direction. We don't know which one. But then you require in a DCPO that all these families must have a supremum, which is a kind of limit. I'm not saying it's a limit, because uh, that would be a theorem, and I haven't even stated what the topology is. And, um, and then, well, there's a topology on each DCPO, it's called the Scott topology, and it's not the Alexandrov topology, it's close, it's a refinement. So it's a topology where it's easier to describe the closed sets. The closed set first is down with closed, so if you have a point, everything below is in it. And the second thing is that if you take a the closed sets are those down with closed sets, such that if you take any directed family inside it, take its supremum, its limit, 
The limit should again be in the closed set, mm -hmm. which is sound. I mean, you expect closed sets to be closed under taking limits. <laughs> so the definition makes sense. That, what actually this means, it actually means that suprema of directed sets are going to be limits. That's what it ensures. In fact, it ensures that these are the largest limits uh, of the directed uh, families. But in any case, um, VCPOs with their scope topology need not be sober. Damn. Because they are very weird DCPOs. And the first example of that is one which I will talk about probably another day. It's a fantastic counterexample. So um, we had this one, we had this one, there's a third one, more complicated, called John Johnston's DCPO. Uh, so Peter Johnston is a uh, mathematician, a British mathematician. Uh, he's most well known for what he's doing in, uh, well, in. Um, in pointless topology, that is in uh, local theory, that is the other side of the coin, looking at it from lattices. He's an expert in two power theory. There are plenty of uh, connections between these two aspects. And uh, a long time ago, he, reali he realized, he actually designed a DCPO with a very funny ordering, which has the property that this DCPO is not so burned in Scott topology. That was an achievement because nobody before that had been able to actually find one and everybody was actually um, uh, um, um, conjecturing that every DCPO would be sober, but that's not the case. Fun uh, nicely enough, in um, semantics, you are usually concerned with DCPOs with more properties, otherwise there are things that don't hold. and. Um, you expect them, for example, to be algebraic, which is a very strong property. Mm -hmm. And usually when algebraic, uh, when you don't get algebraic DCPOs, the next best property is continuous DCPOs. But as you see, that makes a lot of adjectives. And I would need to define them properly to, that will be another day. And it turns out that every continuous DCPO is sober in its top topology. And that is a very tri trivial example of a continuous, even algebraic DCPO. In fact, every finite pole set is algebraic, and the Scott topology coincides with the Alexander topology in that case. Okay. So this is another completely different but very large class of spaces which are sober. Well, if you're an expert, and I know there's at least one in the room, uh, you know that you can actually push that to quasi-continuous DCPOs, <laughs> but I will stop there. <coughs> uh, there are yet other classes of sober spaces. Uh, for example, in my book, I have a third class, which is the uh, topological spaces that underlie a Smith's complete quasi-metric space. space. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's completely obvious to you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in a recent paper with uh, Mathieu de Brecht, uh, Xiaodong Jia, and uh, Zhen Xiaolu, uh, we have proved that there's a funny class of spaces which uh, we have called LCS complete spaces, um, for which I had uh, asked for a good name f mm, for a long time in this uh, lab, which I dis and eventually I decided, uh, I decided upon a bad temporary name which now is uh, definite. And uh, <laughs> of course, everybody knew that any temporary name would be a definite one. <laughs> so I call them LCS complete spaces. <laughs> and these are the G delta subspaces of locally compact sober spaces. Oh, what fun topology can be. <laughs> and uh, these are all sober again. And they actually contain well, the. This is the talk you will give at the Digicom's result table. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, in the absolutely. sense, in the sense that for every so talk I'm giving at Digicos, I'm saying that. <laughs> and the <laughs> reason is that that talk has been cancelled, so I'm quantifying you over an empty universe. So whatever I can say is true. <laughs> so what I mean uh, with that is that you have lots of classes of sober spaces. It's not an isolated property. It happens really often. Yes. And do we have any uh, order based? Uh, characterization of sober spaces? No, because you can have. Uh, uh, this depends on the topology, not just on the specialization ordering. Okay. Um, 
Um, the problem is that you may have different topologies on the same set uh, with exactly the same specialization ordering. Some of them will be sober, some of them will not. And, uh, and so, no, this, is, this can't be characterized using just the specialization ordering. So, in the extreme case, if you take N with a cofinite topology, specialization ordering is equality. There are plenty of topologies which have that specialization ordering. The discrete topology, for example. Uh, the discrete topo with a discrete topology, N is sober because it's housed off. But with this one, which has exactly the same ordering, mm -hmm. it's not sober. So this is really a property of the topology and not of the ordering. Simon? Yeah, among, among all the topologies on the space X that have the same specialization ordering, the Alex and Ruff topology gives you the smallest topology. Uh, no, it gives you the largest, the, largest, okay. the finest ones, the ones that has the, the largest amount of opens. Okay, and so don't you have a calculation when you start from a, a quasi ordering? Uh, how do you know if the, the Alexander topology will be sober? Don't you have a characterization? Oh yes, there is a characterization for that. You need, you need your, your ordering to be actually a set of ideals or something? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't remember the exact right characterization. We would have to do the exercise. It has to do with, uh, with ascending chains. Uh, so typically, we've had that problem with uh, natural numbers, etc. that we had an ascending chain an ascending chain without any upper bound. <coughs> the, your, your missing points in the subrefications now yeah. on the ordering other theory side, it's uh, it's missing limits of uh, increasing chains. Yeah, and then I could actually mention that, which would be the last thing I would say today. Um, you have a kind of converse to these things, which is that theorem. I'm coming back to that later. I'm answering your question first. But uh, the trick is, if you take a sober space, so I should say let X be sober, okay, um, <laughs> it turns out that if you look at X as a pole set, so you forget the topology and you just keep the specialization ordering. So this is a pole set. It's not just pre-ordered by that, or quasi-ordered by that, because x is sober and that is an ordering. Um, it turns out that this is automatically a, DC, a DCPO. So uh, I'm saying that because you just said it adds some kinds of missing limits, and that makes it kind of more precise, that it says that uh, it, it adds so many points that in particular it must add all the, the, the suprema of directed families. It's not equivalent, it's an implication, and as I said, Johnston's DCPO shows that it's not equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, let me return uh, to your example. Um, so, uh, if you take an ex Alexandrov uh, topology, um, yeah, so I have a complicated argument, which uh, you, Simon, know perfectly well, which is that the sobrification of an Alexandrov space is actually its space of ideals with a Scott topology. Uh, the, and this is, um, the irreducible closed sets in that case are exactly the ideals. And you want that to be a bijection. So that means that the only ideals you can find are of the form down arrow x. Which means that the only ideals you can have must have a largest element <coughs> which is that x. An ideal is a directed family which is also down and closed. And uh, so that means that every directed family must contain its supremum. Yeah, so you, you, you cannot prove that it's finite or something like right? I don't remember whether uh, it's only finite. If you, if you, if you take an I have, chain, you, you I have some kind of memory that, that it's, it's more complicated than that. It's closed. Um, and um, 
Yeah, but I have the impression that it's just that. It would be the uh, process with the ascending chain condition, that is, if you take any ascending chain, then it must stop after some time, some finite time. But finally, in the back of my mind, I remember of a result that said that the condition was slightly more complicated. And um, uh, it said something like every uh, chain without an upper bound Every chain with an upper bound must have a maximal element, something like that. I don't remember. It's something like that. We could do the exercise. Huh? Uh, do, do you want... Oh. We could do it together, or you could think about it for next time. What is the right condition? Uh, by the way, I'm pretty sure I've written it down in one of my papers. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just one last question. Uh, so you say here that the converse cannot hold because of Johnston counter example, but yes. Johnston proved that uh, starting from a DCPO, oh, yeah. the Alexandra no, 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 the, the, the start topology, topology might not be solver. Yeah. But when you take the specialization ordering, are you sure you get back? The yeah, uh, you uh, the, uh, the specialization of ordering of this card topology of an ordering is that ordering. Okay. Yeah. And this is not true for Alexandrov. This is also true for Alexandrov. In fact, if you look at all the topologies, so imagine you represent all the topologies that you can find on a given set on a kind of line to, so as to compare them. It's definitely not a linear order, or ordering. <laughs> eh? but if you try to find the region in which all these topologies have a, a fixed uh, specialization ordering, then you have the Alexandrov topology, which is the one that contains uh, the largest possible number of opens. So mm -hmm. Any topology that has less than or equal to as a specialization ordering, okay, has a property that its open sets must be open closed with respect to that. Uh, and a press close means open in the Alexandrov topology. Okay. So any topology with that ordering must be included in the mm -hmm. Alexandrov topology, and the Alexandrov topology has exactly that as an ordering. So it's the largest element in the lattice of topologies with a given uh, specialization ordering. There's a least topology which has this property. And it's called the upper topology. Uh, which is a very bad name because it's actually defined through lower sets. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, uh, it's very easy to find. You realize that, uh, remember that in any topology, the closure of one point is the downward closure of a point. Okay? So if you have fixed the specialization ordering, then the downward closures of points must be closed. So you take the smallest topology that has this property. So typically, if you look at what this means, it means that, okay, you have to take the complements of downward closures of one point, take finite intersections and arbitrary unions. Well, you can simplify that a bit because the finite in un uh, sorry, finite intersections of complements of downward closures blah, 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 are the, the complements of downward closures of finite sets. And so what you get is topology whose opens are, I should actually mention that as closed sets. Uh, opens are unions over an arbitrary index set of sets which are the complement of downward closure of finite elements, of finite sets. So that is called the upper topology. And by the way, if you start from the from equality, so if your ordering is equality, what you get as topology is the cofinite topology. <laughs> <laughs> There's no accident. No. <laughs> <laughs> and all the topologies with a given specialization ordering are sandwiched in between these two. Mm -hmm. And when you start from a post set and you take the Scott topology, well, usually the Scott topology is around here. <laughs> it must be in between, but it's usually strictly in between. Um, so in fact, there's another aspect to that theorem, which is not only is that a DCPO, but then you started with a given topology, and 
that is a DCPO, so it has the SCART topology. So you get a second topology. And you can actually say that the SCART topology is finer right, than the original topology. Meaning that you may have added new open sets, but you've not removed any. I don't think we have time to prove that. <laughs> or to introduce assumptions. <laughs> um, so I probably we might do that later, or I, I would probably like to do some refreshing things that is talking about a junction. Let me just admit that it's not very hard, but uh, yeah, no, it's not hard. But, uh,